You're listening to Mind Pump, the world's number one fitness, health, and entertainment podcast. In this episode, we talk about how to build amazing, round, full, sculpted shoulders with some of the best exercises you've probably never heard of. Um, this episode is brought to you by our sponsor, Viore. Now, Viore makes some of the most amazing athleisure wear you'll find anywhere. These are comfortable clothes you can work out in or go out in, high quality, and they come with a lifetime guarantee. And because you listen to Mind Pump, you get 25% off your first order. So here's what you do if you want to check out their stuff. Go to vioriclothing.com forward slash Mind Pump. That's Viori, V-U-O-R-I, clothing.com forward slash Mind Pump. Get 25% off. Also, this month, we are running a promotion on two of our most popular workout programs, MAPS Anabolic, a full-body, muscle-building, fat-burning, metabolism-boosting program, and our core training program, the No BS Six-Pack Formula, which is designed to bring definition out in your abs and your obliques, even at higher body fat per percentages. Now, these programs will give you a full three-month workout. It comes with video demos, tells you how many reps, how many sets, what the exercises are, basically everything you need to develop an amazing physique. Now, normally, both programs retail at $174, but right now, you can get both of them for $59.95, one payment for lifetime access. Here's what you do. Go to mapsoctober.com. That's the letter M-A-P-S, october.com. By the way, these programs come with a 30-day money-back guarantee, so you can enroll Follow the program for a full month. If it doesn't blow your mind, if it's not the best workout you've ever had, if you don't get great results, return it for a full refund. One more time, it's mapsoctober.com. What would you guys say in terms of like body parts of the body, right? What would you say is probably the most universally seeked out body part in terms of Focus of development, like you know, we could say both guys and girls. You mean? Yeah, so just across the board, what is the body part that universally contributes the most to aesthetics to both men and women, and and is most commonly searched for by everybody? So I don't mm. know if it's the most commonly searched for the but unisex muscle. The what? <laughs> stupid dude. It, what? Yeah. Made Never up. mind. The my I don't know if it's the most searched, but. I do think that so I almost always both male and female when I when I'm coaching like competitors, uh, and you know I, a lot of times obviously I use the protocol from Maps Aesthetic which has like focus sessions and the idea is that mm -hmm. between shows we pick one or two muscle groups that we're going to build and develop, and as we then present it on stage and then get judged. Always uh, one of the muscles that I always focus on both male or female is shoulders. Now, I don't know if that is something that is the most widely searched or what people think mm -hmm. uh, are one of the most important muscles for them to develop for aesthetics. Well, you know what? Based on our guides, uh, so we have, we have, you know, for people who don't know, we have a lot of free guides that we offer on training different body parts, on alleviating pain, fat loss, muscle gain, mm -hmm. um, just as a way to provide more information for people. They're very valuable. And the one that is downloaded the most by both men and women because we can look we have a build your butt guide right mm -hmm. more women download that by far than men build your arms guide more men download that by yeah than i was women. gonna say arms but yeah i could see shoulders shoulders is taking that for sure shoulders is by men and women and it makes sense because and i'm gonna go back to what you're saying adam and, and let me know if this is uh you know because i never was in the competing world although i, I did admire the competing space B but you, men develop shoulders gives them the v taper looks masculine Women are attracted to it. Women, when they develop shoulders, it's what makes the arms look good. A lot of women think it's the biceps and triceps that make it the arm look sculpted. For no, women. It's, it's, it's the it, shoulder. Shoulder separates those. Yes, it makes a huge difference. No, I, I, I. So I've told this story on here before. Um, when I had a, a female competitor when I was in my early twenties, she worked for me, and she was like I don't know, a good 10, 15 years older than I am, and incredible physique. She competed, and I asked her to. Uh, take a look at my physique and critique it. And like, she like just- She's honest. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. She was too honest, I think. You know, I think I was looking for, I think it was actually me searching for compliments actually at that time. Like, <laughs> hey, tell hey. me, tell me what you think about oh, my physique. Oh, there's actually nothing yeah. you could do differently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here, I'm gonna take You're my shirt amazing. off. Yeah, yeah. Gonna, yeah. Look happen. at my body real quick. Tell me yeah, what you think. Yeah, yeah. So I think I was- <laughs> She's I think, like, I will. I think I was yeah. searching for compliments because I had been on like a kick for a while and I think I was uh, being consistent and felt good about my physique and she just totally fucking, <laughs> just let the air out. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, she just uh, she said that uh, my shoulders were terrible. She said that well, I those had, are words. Yeah, right. So oh, she, wow. Yeah, yeah. So she said, uh, well, she said it in her real thick German accent too. It was funny. And even she, worse. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Your shoulders are terrible. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's just yeah, just like that. And she said specifically my rear delts. She says, you know, you have you have great arms, so your biceps and tricep, you can tell that you train a lot and you've developed them, but they're overdeveloped in comparison to your delts. And so then it gives you this like sloping arm look, and then your physique would be far more impressive if you had shoulders. Now, the truth is, <clears throat> the way my training looked back then, this is what I was guilty of. Um, I didn't put a lot of focus on shoulders. Um, I figured I do a lot of you know rows and back stuff, and I do a lot of pressing things like chest exercises. So anterior delts, rear delts are getting worked in both those uh, movements. And so every once in a while, I threw in lateral raises. You know, like oh okay, make sure I throw some lateral raises. But that was the main focus for my shoulders. The rest, I figured they are getting work every time I do chest, I'm getting mm -hmm. work every time I do a back. So I just didn't focus on them. It was after that comment that I was like, man, I, okay, well, I've never really tried to program with the intent of building my shoulders and I began to do it. And it completely uh, changed the way my physique looked. Yeah, the irony of this is that you, as a competitor, your, delt, your shoulders were your probably one of your strongest, if not your strongest mm. body part, I would say. Yeah, that, and that was, and it all stemmed all the way back to this because once I, I went on this kick of, okay, shoulders need to become a priority and I began to work on them and it took a long time. It didn't happen overnight. It wasn't like she said that to me, I changed a couple things in my routine and then boom, all of a sudden I had impressive shoulders. It was years of, of working and training and focusing on that. But I, I started to notice such a massive difference. And I also realized that I lost a couple inches, well, maybe not a couple inches, more like an inch, right? I lost on the size of my circumference of my arm, but yet I was getting all these arm compliments. Oh my God, your arms look so impressive. Uh, and I remember thinking like, that's so crazy because measurement wise, I've lost size because I wasn't putting as much time and energy on building my buys and tries because that's what she told me. They were overdeveloped. Mm -hmm. My shoulders were underdeveloped. And yet- I'm getting more arm compliments than I ever had. So yeah, that set me on this this trajectory of really focusing on shoulders as a focal point of my training. And to this day, when I take on a competitor and I'm helping them for competing, always, male or female, mm. there's always room, I feel like, for improvement on shoulders. There, and there's anomalies, right? There's those, There's a few people out there that I look at and go, oh man, those shoulders are crazy. But yeah. most people neglect... Uh, either the shoulder in general or in, in most cases, I feel the rear delts. I think the rear delts are overlooked a well, lot. Well, I honestly feel, and I, and I get you know where we're going in terms of you know muscle development and you know the aesthetic of it and everything but i look at the shoulder as being just as crucial as like the glutes in terms of function and and athleticism and power and uh, there, there's so many different um aspects to the shoulder to consider and it needs a lot of attention that people aren't giving the shoulder and, and in turn that actually helps to then uh you know build a more symmetrical a more filled mm -hmm. out uh shoulder that you know you'd be more happy with well no that's a great point justin I, I think i started on the aesthetic path first and then i think as i became more educated more experienced i learned just how important it was to have healthy shoulders in general i mean when you look at the joint of the shoulder and the, we see more issues stemming from either the hips or the shoulders than any other place as a yep. trainer so when people complain of neck pain and shoulder pain and upper back pain, much of that is all related to what's going on with the shoulder, right? The capsule and what, how it moves and how what kind of range of motion that you've, you have or the lack of uh, in, in your shoulder. And so like the hips. So as I started to realize how important it was to keep my shoulders mobile, uh, then I started to focus even more on them. So yeah, yeah. I mean, the more complex a joint is, the the more challenging it could be for the average person to develop, right? Because mm -hmm. when you look at the shoulder joint, it's it's probably of the major joints. I would say it's the most complex, right? You have uh, the the humerus, the top of the arm that moves uh, around. You have the scapula. Okay, so this is part of the shoulder girdle. This is why they refer to the shoulder girdle. There's so many moving parts. Then you have the scapula that can rotate up or down or retract or protract. You have the clavicle that adds some stability. So it's a pretty complex joint. Part of the reason why it's complex, by the way, is that you know humans evolved uh, doing something very, very well. It's actually a very important part of our evolution that made us apex predators. Uh, predators excuse me, is it allows us to throw things 
with tremendous force uh, and accuracy. So if you look at the shoulder joint, very complex. If you don't understand this or if you don't uh, balance out the shoulder in terms of its function and then you go work out, you're not going to have developed shoulder uh, muscles. You're not going to be able to train and develop your shoulders properly uh, because they're just not moving properly. So one of the more important aspects of shoulder development that people overlook because when you look at your typical muscle building routine, they don't include this component is – mobility, priming, stability, in all these different ways that the shoulder works. If you don't have that, then you can do all the overhead presses you want and all the laterals that you want. You're not going to be able to develop good shoulders. In fact, what you'll end up doing is developing uh, upper traps. You might develop your arms a little bit more. Yeah, greater imbalances. But, you might, but you're going to end up with uh, shoulders that don't really stand out. Or you may think to yourself – man, my shoulders are a stubborn body part. This is a body part that is just, a, I'm a hard gainer when it comes to my shoulders. And the people I've worked with who said that to me about their shoulders, uh, nine out of 10 times, it didn't have anything to do with the fact that their shoulders didn't develop as fast as their biceps and triceps. It had everything to do with the fact that they just didn't have great movement patterns in their shoulders. So this is an important thing to, to really pay attention to. And it to. needs to be a well-rounded approach. So totally. yeah, you can keep uh, you know your posture in, in good uh, upright position. And that's one of those things, like if you're presenting your body it, just in everyday uh, activities, you're, you're walking around, like people notice how good your posture is and that, that in turn, it, it builds up your own confidence. And you know, one of those factors is like, are you training to promote better posture? Are you training to put yourself in balance, so in an imbalanced position. Yeah, no, as a kid, for me, I, um, you know, when I first started working out, right, skinny kid, really wanted to build muscle. And um, I got uh, a couple bad, um, not a couple, quite a few bad comments on my shoulders as a kid. So, like you, Adam, I was motivated by <laughs> negative feedback, right? Right, right? Now, I have naturally narrow bone structure, um, so I'm not a wide person, plus, I was skinny. And so people would say, you know, you know how kids are, right? You look like a coat hanger or you're really narrow. And so I'm mm -hmm. like, I'm going to develop my shoulders. Luckily for me, I, you know, was really, I really valued uh, educating myself on how to train properly. So I had Arnold Schwarzenegger's Encyclopedia of Bodybuilding, which lists every free weight exercise you can think of for every body part. And so the shoulder section in there was huge. I also read uh, books by Vince Garanda. Um, and I read other old publications. And I also looked at athletes who I thought had a, a great shoulder development. So I looked at boxers. If you notice, boxers always have really nice looking balanced shoulders. Makes sense. They're always throwing punches. Uh, gymnasts tend to have really well-developed shoulders. So at a young age, uh, luckily, I trained my shoulders uh, through stability and balance without even knowing what those things meant. And I did a wide variety of exercises which resulted in, for me, also, my delts tend to be one of my stronger uh, body parts. But it really has to do with the fact that, you know, when, we, when you talk about training and training different angles and using exercises that train joints through different ranges of motion with different types of tension, it's probably more important for the shoulders than it is for almost any other muscle because there's such a complex uh, joint. Um, now, here's the thing. There are some great exercises that people do a lot of. Standing overhead presses. Dumbbell overhead presses, military standing, press, military standing, you know, or, or side laterals and stuff like that. Yeah, those are great exercises, but there's a lot of forgotten exercises and movement. And I say forgotten because they were popular at one time, or other athletes did them a lot, or we just haven't really seen them be very popular nowadays. Um, and maybe at one point people did them. They're forgotten, but they shouldn't be because they have tremendous value for anybody. And I utilized uh, a lot of the exercises that we're going to talk about today to develop my shoulders, and I found them to be very, very valuable. In fact, you'll get more out of your standard military press, uh, dumbbell presses, if you incorporate some of these forgotten movements and get your shoulders to function and move uh, optimally. Then when you do a military press, all of a sudden, your shoulders really uh, respond well. Well, we, we listed off the, the, the 10 forgotten or the 10 best forgotten exercises, right, for your shoulders. I think there's also an order of operation, right? So I do think that the first thing that I, I want to focus on is, is mobility, right, is the ability to be able to first move your shoulders through its full range of motion. If you're going to maximize the potential of them, and then also for healthy joints like Justin always alludes to, it's important that we, we prime and we mobilize first. Yes. Now, now, priming, what priming does is priming essentially 
encourages better movement patterns and turns on, for lack of a better term, because I know there's uh, trainers and uh, you know experts who say, oh, mu- you know, muscles aren't turned on or off. Okay, I'm, I'm using the term turned on or off, but what I'm referring to is the fact that you can feel them more and you're more connected to better movement. That's what priming does. So if you prime properly, you are mentally more connected to the shoulder muscles, uh, to the function of the shoulders. And this uh, studies will show that this priming lasts for about an hour. So when you prime properly, then you get into your workout. What you're essentially doing is unlocking more benefits from all the exercises you're about to do. So if your Mm -hmm. overhead shoulder press uh, is worth 10 points, proper priming is going to ensure that you get all 10 points. Not priming, priming properly and having poor movement patterns might mean that you get six points out of an exercise that could potentially give you 10. And priming doesn't take a long time. You're talking about 10 minutes before your workout to squeeze out uh, 10 more percent out of your workout, which adds up, adds up big time over time. Yeah, I, I was just trying to think of an analogy for that, but I was just thinking if you're if you're putting together like uh, you know a race or something, and you're ahead of time, you're putting all the signs out and like directing where you're gonna go. Like priming, for instance, is ahead of time. We're just directing where all this recruitment is gonna go, and we're we're doing this in a way that's more efficient. So that way, when you're going into your workouts, you're you're properly stabilized, you're in good position, and you're really lighting up and and you know getting everything to move accordingly. Yeah, so- so here's an example of that. So if you've ever practiced balancing on something, maybe back when you were a kid or maybe you do it now with your kids and you're walking on something and you're trying to balance, you'll notice the second time around you have better balance, right? So you practice once, fall off, try it again. Second or third time, all of a sudden you have better balance. What's happening is your central nervous system, you're priming it by attempting to do something. And the central nervous system now is communicating a little bit more effectively to your muscles. I remember years ago there was this fad product that was around and there were some professional athletes that actually would promote this product and it was like a bracelet or a necklace and it had some special yeah. you know pla- the, the magic magnet yeah uh, it was like some yeah. magnet or, pre- or it was like some plastic that had these properties and what you do is you put on this bracelet and all of a sudden you had better performance and i remember they they sell these at the mall and i walked by <laughs> a kiosk and there was this dude who was selling these bracelets and he was proving how effective this bracelet was and this is what he did he, you go up to him, and I remember seeing this. I'm like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go have fun with this guy. So he says, okay, stand on your right foot and balance. Hold out your left arm, and I'm going to push down on your left arm. And so I did, and you know, I fell over. He said, now put this bracelet on and try it again. And of course, my balance is ba- better when I had the bracelet on. And now the average person is like, oh my gosh, I'm going to buy this bracelet. This thing is magic. Right. I understood the central nervous system. I'm like, well, yeah, I'm going to be better the second time around, <laughs> yeah. no matter what, because the first time you know tells, coming. tells my CNS what's going to happen. Right. Now take the bracelet off and let me do a third time. That's right. So <laughs> that's what, until you fatigue, right? That's what priming does. So priming sets you up to get a better workout. And it's important for all your muscle groups really important for a complex uh, joint like the shoulder. Well, yeah. I, the, I have a way, a, maybe a simple, even simpler way to explain to clients is like the shoulder is, is, is floating, right? Essentially. And so you have all these muscles that are around it that are supporting it. And we, before we go do a shoulder press, a lateralize, any movement, we, I, we ideally want it to be floating like evenly, evenly in the center. And what ends up happening if you have these muscles that are dormant, that are responsible for helping keeping it neutral like that, it leans to the front more, or it leans to the back more, or it leans to the side more. And then it catches and it feels weird and you hear clicking mm-hmm. noises or you hear pain. Yeah. This is what happens when all those supporting muscles are not woke up. So the very first thing, and this is why I love the handcuff with a rotation as like the ultimate priming movement mm-hmm. for the shoulder because that entire exercise takes the shoulder through its fullest range of motion, both internally and externally rotated. And that wakes everything up before I go into any movement. I want all those supporting muscles to be awake and keeping that shoulder nice and neutral and balanced. Yes. So Mm -hmm. when you do handcuff with rotation, as the first rep you're doing it through and you're going through slow and connecting, it'll feel at some points tight. You might feel like you get a little stuck. Ooh, that doesn't, I don't know how that feels. You're moving through. By the second, third, fourth rep, you're now everything's moving the way it's supposed to. Now the shoulder's functioning more optimally because the CNS is firing things a little better. By the third, fourth, fifth rep, things feel a lot better, more connected. Yeah. So this is a this is a great way to start your shoulder workout. Start with handcuffs with yeah. rotation. And this is unloaded, and and this kind of leads into the next area where I'm very passionate about, and I I just want to bring it up because I know I see this in the gym all the time. I don't see many people adding in 
types of, of especially loaded rotational moves. Uh, it's and it's hard to come up with because it's not very uh, you know top of mind for a lot of people, and it's not in a lot of programming. But now we take that same concept that you guys are talking about with handcuffs of rotation but that's unloaded now we want to apply a reasonable amount of of weight uh to to also actually work those muscles work those rotator muffles muscles and, and mu muffles <laughs> muffles yeah it's like bubbles but it's muffles um, yeah and so we're working those now to, to to add strength and have that um you know, be active also when you're going into your overhead presses. So if I, it's a lot, a lot of times it's too similar to like uh, sleepy butt syndrome, as we call it, right? So a lot of times you're going through squats, you don't feel it in your glutes as much, you're quad dominant. Uh, you may be a little bit dominant, uh, let's say in your anterior delts, where, you know, if I'm pressing, that's all I'm feeling it. But if I now apply movements like uh, in Indian clubs, I call it the, the heart swing. So it takes your, your arm and your shoulder through the entire entire uh, uh, rotational movements that your shoulder's capable of, but now it's loaded. Uh, so if I'm going through that process, I'm, I'm more likely to feel those muscles contribute uh, in my standard overhead press. Yeah, well, Indian clubs were uh, very popular among Indian wrestlers who at one point were quite dominant uh, in the world. And uh, wrestlers require, uh, they need incredible uh, mobility. I mean, in the truest sense, right? Not just flexibility, but strength in wide ranges of motion, um, especially in the hips and the shoulders. If you ever watch a wrestling match, you see some of the positions that they get in. And they used Indian clubs quite a bit, along with uh, mace bells, which is another another movement that kind of works that yeah. area. And it's great exactly for what you said. It loads kind of that full range of motion. And I a little think, bit. too, to, to make it, because I know these are both uh, things that are unconventional and you don't have a lot of access to this uh, in your gym. So... If you do have a kettlebells, another good exercise for this is a kettlebell halo, uh, and that just uh, rotates it behind your head, and you express yes. all those different rotational movements through that. Uh, also with a dumbbell, so there's there's options for that, but it's definitely one I wouldn't skip over. Well, what I love about this too is that if you've done your due diligence and you've done a lot of priming and you've done a lot of work on keeping your shoulders mobile, a lot of times you can skip handcuff with rotation and go right into Indian clubs, mace bells, or like halos, which right. is how I typically warm my shoulders up now. So I put a lot of work in with mobility to make sure that I can express my shoulder in its full range of motion and the ability to rotate it like Justin's talking about. So now I can just go grab some light Indian clubs or mace bell and kind of swing it and kind of wake it all up together. But for, if you're somebody who has limited range of motion or has shoulder issues, you definitely want to start with something unloaded, right? Just your body and do that intrinsically first. Get good at that to kind of wake everything up and then you load it with something like Indian Club's mace or the or the um, halo. Right. Now the next uh, movement, which would be, um, I, I think it makes sense to kind of do it after you would do your handcuffs with rotation or your halo, for example, is an overhead carry. An overhead carry, literally just like it sounds, you would take a pair of dumbbells or kettlebells, Press them straight up over your head, straighten your arms, stay tight, walk for maybe 50 yards or 25 yards, but stay tight and controlled and brace your core. Now, what this is doing is it's really stabilizing your shoulder joint. It's turning everything on. You're not supposed to use a ridiculous amount of weight. You want to use some weight that's challenging, but really the idea is to brace and express your strength in that fully extended position. This turns things on like nothing else. I didn't do these as part of a routine until I met Justin. This alone I probably added about 10 pounds to my overhead presses just because I remember when I lifted, after I did overhead carries, just pressing a barbell overhead, I just felt uh, more stable. You know, it felt like I, I could just, I could push harder because things were more yeah, tight. You get, like more acclimated to having weight over your head and, and you know how to navigate with that and be able to brace and uh, your, your body responds uh, once you start doing that. Uh, when you when you go back to overhead presses, you're just stronger in that lockout position. Uh, one thing I like to add to this is they call it sort of shoulder packing. Uh, and I know that there's different, uh, uh, 
ideas about this, about letting your shoulder elevate up as you as you bring your arm up versus just packing your shoulder and, and creating an anchor uh, with your shoulder blade. I prefer uh, the anchoring. Uh, so that way, when we're pressing to it, you have your shoulder nicely secure and stabilized while you're locking your, your arm all the way over your head. I yeah. also love this as an opportunity to address other cues of the rest of the body, right? So when someone's doing a, a continuous movement like a shoulder press, it's really hard to get them to focus on other parts of their body while they're also pressing at the same time. They're focused so much on just getting the weight over their head that they're thinking about their arms, their shoulders, their upper their upper body, where there is a big part of like standing overhead pressing that is also related to like your core and your hips that mm -hmm. people neglect and also see a lot of issues with like low back. Because what you see is you see a press over the head. Uh, the natural tendencies for a lot of people is to get like a, a rib cage flare. So the rib cage will flare out and the low back will arch. It's like they're leaning back almost. Exactly. And it's very natural for that to happen if you just tell someone to press over their head. Where if I have them put dumbbells or kettlebells above their head, they're in that shoulder pack position. They're stabilizing there. Now I can cue below. I can say, okay, activate your core. So tighten your abs up. Tuck the let the let the ribs f come down. Don't let them flare out to where you're arching. Activate your glutes. Squeeze your butt. So just like if we do like on a glute bridge, I want you to squeeze your butt so you don't have this excessive arch in your low back. Now walk forward. So that's mm -hmm. I love to do. Teach a client this, and I'll get them holy. And I'll start lighter, right? I know I could probably challenge them with a the heavier weight because I'm looking at all these cues. I don't want it to be so hard. It's hard for them to hold over their head for a while. So I'll, I'll do light dumbbells or kettlebells, get them in that complete full extension over their head, make sure their arms are lined up with their ears so they're completely extended. Then I'll look down at their ribs, make sure their ribs are tucked in, the, the uh, core is tight, abs are tight, and then squeeze your glutes and then start to walk. Yeah, you're emphasizing you know, adding intensity to the stabilizing muscles. And that's that's really the focus. So that way, you know, they they do what they're supposed to do once you're doing, you know, the, the gross motor movement. Right. right. Now the first exercise that I think some people do, but it's super it's definitely not common. Um, has a tremendous amount of value for shoulder de development, is a kettlebell bottoms up press. So typically with a kettlebell, when you press a kettlebell overhead, what you'll see most of the time is the kettlebell is resting on the forearm and the handle is on the top, right? And so they press up with the kettlebell in that position. A bottoms up press literally is is upside down. You take the kettlebell, you flip it so that the handle is at the bottom and the weight is at the top. Now you think, what's the difference? Uh, it's the same amount of weight. Huge difference. Oh, yeah. In order to press with the weight at the top, I have to really balance my arm and my hand underneath the weight of the kettlebell. If I move it too far forward or back, the weight is going to flop forward mm -hmm. or flop back. I have to balance. It also slows me down a lot. A bottoms up press is not fast. It's very slow and very, very uh, controlled. It also requires a very full, very tight, tight grip. grip. Now, one problem a lot of people make when they press is their grip gets loose, like they're, they're, they're resting the barbell or the dumbbell in the palm of their hand. Tightening your grip turns on the central nervous system even more. The CNS, the central nervous system, is more powerful the more you turn it on in your whole body. In fact, if you were to exert yourself right now, if you were just to squeeze your hand as hard as you possibly could with every bit of strength, you would naturally tense up your entire body, including your face. That's because it, the, the when you turn on the whole body, the CNS turns on more for every part of your body rather than just turning on for one part of my body. So pre you're squeezing the handle. You have to balance your elbow and your hand underneath it, and it slows the rep down. It's like uh, you can't do a bottoms-up press without really good controlled, uh, yeah. perfect form. Yeah, and, and to make a nice, tight fist is something that uh, you know is so protective. It's so su supportive on the wrist, the elbows, the shoulder. Uh, if you can emulate that too in your barbell lifts uh, as much as possible, making that nice tight wrist but not having that break uh, when you're when you're doing other exercises as well, that's going to be massively beneficial. So this is one of those types of exercises that really has a lot of carryover and a lot of other exercises. So I told you originally that I was focused heavily on the aesthetics and then it was later on like the control and the movement of the shoulder and, and mobility and all that came to play. And once that came into play for me was when I actually got to express uh, like power movements and to see how that 
and what that did for my shoulders. Oh boy, yeah. And and this was an, another pivotal moment in my my shoulder training journey was starting to incorporate power exercises um, because I didn't identify with uh, power lifters or Olympic lifters. I neglected a lot of these exercises. I trained much like a a bodybuilder, a lot of hypertrophy, pumping type of exercises, supersets. Um, I didn't spend a lot of time doing explosive type stuff, especially for my shoulders. And I remember when I started to introduce these next two exercises into my routine, my shoulders blew up. And so that first one is the high pulls. Um, it's something that I never practiced before, something I never did in my routine, but couldn't believe, especially how much my my lateral delt and rear delt blew up yep. from doing these these movements. It blew me away. Yeah, and you know what's funny is the the old time lifters they did almost all their shoulder exercises exclusively. I wouldn't want to say all, but almost all were exclusively power. Yeah. It was about explosive movements, pushing things up overhead, bringing things up off the ground. Well, they had to bring everything off the ground first. They didn't have racks. They didn't have racks. So that anything that went overhead, they had to start on the ground. And so they needed these elements like this, this type of a clean movement or a high pull, for instance, for here, just to get it up into the rack position to press. Yes. Yeah, so there's two ways to turn on, to really activate the what are called the fast twitch muscle fibers. Now, I'm going to simplify because it's a little bit more complex than this, but generally speaking, there are two general categories of muscle fibers in the body. You have your slow twitch and your fast twitch. The fast twitch ones are the ones that build. They're the ones that add size. The slow twitch ones, they are good for endurance. They become more efficient. And they don't add a lot of size because bigger muscle fibers use more energy. And if you want lots of endurance, you don't want to. You want to become more efficient with energy, not less efficient. This is why long-distance runners have skinny legs uh, with very little muscle versus sprinters who have big muscular legs, right? So it's the fast twitch muscle fibers that grow. There's two ways to really activate uh, fast twitch muscle fibers. One is through heavy weight where you're maximally exerting yourself, whether it's for three reps or 10 reps, you'll turn on more fast twitch muscle fibers. The other way is speed, mm -hmm. power. Like you're, you're, if you're throwing a, a baseball, a baseball weighs, uh, you know, I don't know how much it weighs, but it's definitely less than a pound. Um, but if you're throwing a baseball as fast as you can, you are turning on as many fast twitch muscle fibers as if you're doing a heavy bench press, for example. Speed does this as well. Power movements turn on fast twitch muscle fibers, and, it, and it's really effective at getting fast twitch muscle fibers that might not be getting super activated. A high pull definitely does this. It requires explosive movement. You're not using a super heavy weight. In fact, the weight should be low to moderate. The idea is speed and explosivity. It turns those muscle fibers on for the shoulders. And if you do do this exercise, you have to have good control, of course, good form. Do this at the beginning of the workout. You don't want to have, you don't want to do a power movement at the end when you're super fatigued or super pumped. You want to do it when you've got good energy. Well, and the benefit too with power movements like that, where it really stretches your capacity now to generate even more uh, force from your central nervous system. And that's beneficial going back into like a strength phase where now I can start in a, in a bottom position, but now I can recruit an even more amount of muscle fibers. So I feel stronger. I feel more powerful to get more weight up and, and it just sort of bleeds all the way into that. Yep. Now the next one, very similar is a hang clean to a press. So hang clean literally is this. You imagine standing with the barbell, um, with your hands holding the barbell, but it's down uh, past your hips, right? So it's, it's at, like you finish a deadlift or whatever. You're just holding a barbell. A clean is bringing the barbell up to your shoulders, and then the press part is pushing it overhead. There is a technique to this. So it's not just a slow reverse curl up to the shoulders in a press. There is speed involved in that cleaning part, and then you do an explosive uh, press. Back in the day, this is how people shoulder pressed. Uh, in fact, if you didn't clean the weight, it wasn't considered a full rep. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until later that people ended, stopped the, the clean aspect and just did the press. Uh, this is unfortunate because although it is technical and requires a little bit more skill, the clean part works the shoulders just like the press uh, part does. So hanging clean to press for power. Ex this is an excellent exercise for developing the shoulder. Well, there's muscle. pull, rotation, and then press in there. That's why. Yep. I mean, that's it's one of those movements that kind of incorporates a lot of what the shoulder can do, all ex and expresses it all in one movement. And you're doing it in a po in a power way, right? Explosive. So that was a, a, a massive one for me. I love I love that. The next one is the Z press. 
The Z Press wasn't something I found until way later. In fact, I'm trying to remember. I think it was when Justin and I started hanging out again. I think it was. Yeah, I think you came to to my gym and yeah. then we started doing it there together. Yeah, yeah. Somebody, I think some because I know they were so many of the guys that you were working with. It's funny too because when you look at a Z Press, you think, "What's the difference?" Yeah, 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 you know, you do think it's silly, and I wish I would have found it earlier in my career because it became a staple move that I used on clients going forward because. Mm. I realized that in order to do a Z press properly, it forces those things that I talked about earlier about like the rib cage flare and keeping your glutes mm -hmm. tucked and, and then good core stability. Mm -hmm. And then also being able to fully extend over your head. So when I think of all the things where clients, you know, cheat a rep or they struggle with the movement when it comes to a shoulder press, I think of the arching of the low back. I think of the rib flare. I think of the, the lack mm -hmm. of full range of motion and locking out. It hits all three of those really, really well. You can't do a Z press and not go full range of motion. The only way you stay balanced is to fully extend it over your head. So then you've got the the stability portion and the full extension portion there. The only way that you're going to stay standing up or seated, seated, seated upright is also if you have great trunk and core stability too. So I love this move. It really does require you to, you know, what lifters will say, uh, put your head through the window, right? When you press yes. a, a barbell up. As it passes your head, you got to bring the head through and really get your arms up uh, next to your head. This will work your shoulders like nothing else. The irony of a Z press is it's, I, in my opinion, it should be the bodybuilder uh, press. This is what bodybuilders should do more of because it forces you to squeeze your shoulders. How often do you feel a shoulder squeeze at the top of a military press? The reason why you don't is because you're not getting that full extension and you're not really straight with your body. The Z press forces that. You're literally forced to have that kind of an overhead press. And you actually get a squeeze in the shoulders at the top of a press, and you get this crazy pump. Yeah, it's one of my favorites for addressing all those stability points that you mentioned. I mean, if you did a bottoms-up press and, and you're focused on that for just your wrist, and then basically the Z-press covers everything else. And right. it's it's so beneficial as a teaching tool, but also just um, you know to sort of reassess what's going right and what's going wrong in your own overhead press. Yes. Now, the next one, this one was popular popular in the 70s and 80s. In fact, if, you know, again, I was a, a I used to love reading uh, you know, training publications and I would even go to there was this comic book store that I used to go to that sold old magazines and old comic books and rarely did they have old muscle building magazines, but when they did, I was I mean every dollar of my allowance was spent on that. And I remember seeing shoulder presses in bodybuilding and muscle building magazines from the 80s and uh, Oftentimes, see, half the time they showed shoulder presses, they were alternating shoulder presses. To me, this was weird because in the 90s, in the magazines that I was reading that were current, shoulder presses with dumbbells, both shoulders, uh, both dumbbells, excuse me, went up at the same time. So it's both, both at the same time. But when I'd see these ones in the 80s, you'd see bodybuilders and people teaching alternating where one is being held at the bottom, staying tight, and the other one is pressing all the way up and then coming back down and then alternating to the other hand. Or they would alternate at the top, or one would stay at the top, one would come down, come up, and then you'd switch. And I thought to myself, what's the difference? You're pressing them or you're not pressing them. It doesn't make a big difference. And then I tried them out. It makes a huge difference. The arm that's staying at the bottom is required to stabilize. You're doing an isometric tension uh, movement on the shoulder, either at the bottom or the top. The other arm is moving, and then you switch arms, and now you're doing an isometric movement on the other arm. The pump and the burn I get from this is tremendous. In fact, uh, even today, I'd say 30% of the time, I'll do alternating shoulder presses. I can't use as much weight yeah. as I do when I don't do them alternating, uh, which shows me that there's it's definitely harder. It's definitely a more difficult type of shoulder it press. It helps to eliminate a bit of body English and, and momentum-based lifting. Uh, I think it's a good tool for that, especially for those points you mentioned with you know, creating more tension, but really it's, it's the control aspect. So, uh, can I, can I control one side of my body while the other one's doing the work and then, you know, do that in, in, in a very controlled, efficient way, or, you know, is the weight having control over me? And so it's, it's sort of one of those things that it's, it's a great tool, but also it, it creates a great strength and, and, you know, hypertrophy pump out of it as well. Now, do you guys prefer to teach this seated or standing? Um, I'd like to do them standing, um, but seated is, is great also. Yeah, I like to teach seated because uh, because you're alternating back and forth. You're focused on the. There's a lot of things to think about. The, yeah, there's a lot of things to think about, and then that just kind of takes the the bottom portion up because that 
this is probably one of the, and you're going to hear me keep talking about this because I think with most clients that struggled with the overhead press, especially when you talk about extending it all the way up, most of them lack that shoulder mobility, and then the rest of the body starts to break down below, and that's mm. what I don't like. like sure. so, so if you do some of these exercises, keep that in mind. That's why things like the the Z press, I think, are so important. It's because there's so much breakdown uh, below that people don't pay attention to because you're thinking the shoulder, right. so everyone's watching it, the shoulder. You'll see their heels raise yeah. as they're pressing it yeah. up and, yeah, things like that to look out for. Yeah, yeah. I, I that You do make a, a very good case for that. And now that I think back, I, I it, it is – now that I'm thinking about it, I did take a lot of clients from standing to seated. So I watched their form and be like, why don't we do this Yeah, sitting I mean, down? I love standing. I mean, if, if you, That's I mean, how I do it. It's more functional. Yeah. If, you, if you're an advanced lifter and you're listening to all these tips, like yeah. by all means, go for it standing. But if I'm teaching this and I'm teaching these principles, um, yeah, I like, to, I like people s sitting down at first so I can teach them the mechanics and what we're trying to accomplish. Once they understand how to tighten their core, or light up their glutes while they're also pressing mm -hmm. and they can do those things together, then it's okay. And then I like things like the the circus press. I know uh, Doug put the highlighted that up on the notes. It's like, you know, similar, similar, not, it's not an alternating press because you're not holding one dumbbell on the opposite side, but it is a one arm press. Yeah. I, you know, circus press might fall in a category closer to being like the hang clean to press Yeah, like mm -hmm. that. It incorporates that internal rotation and you get the, uh, you also get the external rotation and then you get the pressing and you get pulling. a whole lot going on. Yeah. With that exercise. Right. I love that movement too. So that belongs somewhere in here. Um, whether you do it at the you know, in alternating, if you're doing unilateral work, or if you're doing it up somewhere like where the hang clean press, yeah. that belongs in yeah. there too. Now the next one, you know, I can see why all these exercises or a lot of these exercises are forgotten. Like a Z press, you sit on the floor, it looks kind of funny. You know, uh, power movements require a lot of skill, and people who think they just want to sculpt their body sometimes think power is uh, something that's important. You know, a bottoms up press is counterintuitive. If you press a kettlebell, why the hell would I press it? you know, upside down, Indian clubs, and, you know, not that popular. I can get why a lot of these are forgotten. Um, it's definitely not because they're not effective, but it's because they look different from traditional exercises. But the next one, I do not understand. It baffles me why this movement is not more popular, and it's the inclined lateral raise. Lateral raises, in general, are very popular, right? It's one of the most common shoulder exercises that you see done in gyms everywhere. It works the side of the shoulder, which gives you that nice width that can give you a great pump. Typically, it's done standing or seated. But one of the drawbacks, I would say, of the lateral raise is the fact that the rate, the, the tension is, is typically uh, due to gravity. So at the top of the lateral raise is where you're going to have the most tension because that's where I'm fighting gravity the most. At the bottom, there's not much. Like to swing a dumbbell from the bottom up you know, a little bit, it doesn't take that much uh, strength. It requires more strength as I come up to the top. Not a bad thing. Uh, again, lateral raises are phenomenal. But what if we took a lateral raise and rather than making the top of the movement the hardest part, make it more at the bottom where you're kind of stretching the side of the shoulder. That's what an inclined lateral raise does. I didn't learn. I learned about these early on because, uh, of course, Arnold Schwarzenegger was somebody I looked up to, um, and I, again, I read his book. And then there was another bodybuilder by the by the name of Serge Nubray. This was a, I believe, he was a French bodybuilder. Till this day, I mean, he's he's he passed away. I think a couple years ago. Um, he competed in the '60s and '70s. Till this day, he's considered one of the most aesthetic bodybuilders of all time. He had this incredible physique, very very balanced, round looking muscles. And he loved doing incline lateral raises. So I, I tried them out myself. And essentially, you land on incline bench on your side. You do your lateral raise. Now the bottom part of the lateral raise is difficult. And let me tell you, if you always do lateral raises standing and you never do them on an incline, try them on an incline. Watch what happens to the side of your shoulders. It'll fry them and you'll get a pump like you've never had. Before. Well, I think that's the main reason why though, right? I mean, wouldn't you agree? It's just because it's it's not normal. Like you rarely ever see somebody doing that exercise and you're you're manipulating the strength curve. And Absolutely. You, you have most people think of lateral raise and they just think of your basic standing, you know, lateral raise or a seated lateral raise machine and that's how you do it like maybe there's some debates on people bending their elbow or completely extended or how heavy they go but it's all pretty basic everybody does it nobody really manipulates the strength curve that much with especially with free weights because we do with cables right cables change cables are just yeah you pull right. these in cables all right the same. cables changes that which i think are also a great tool when doing laterals but 
to manipulate that with a, a dumbbell, I think is very unique. Yes. And mm -hmm. it's also one arm at a time. And this is really good when you're doing a kind of a sculpting isolation exercise, like a lateral raise, because it allows you to really, because here's the value of these kind of single joint sculpting exercises. The value is connecting, really connecting to a particular part of the muscle, much harder to do with a compound movement. And it's even, you can connect even more when you do one arm at a time. So you do a one arm because you can't do two arm incline lateral raise, right? It's impossible. You're laying on one side. So it forces you to really focus on feeling the side of the shoulder, very hard part of the shoulder to feel. And in my opinion, um, the incline lateral raise is one of the best ways uh, to do it. Now, the last exercise uh, is a reverse fly done with either cables or bands. Probably uh, one of the most underutilized exercises I can think about. You can right. tell by looking at people's shoulders. They don't work the rear delts uh, very much. Well, a lot of I think a lot of that is because they, it's less that everybody doesn't exercise or work this muscle. It's that it's a harder muscle to target, and I think most people that do reverse flies or do rear delt movements tend to allow their back muscles to yeah. engage and do the work. It's, it's like a rear right. uh, row or a, a shrug. Yeah, so I, we did a good video. Jordan Shallow and I did a good video a few years back on our YouTube channel, so you can look up on Mind Pump TV, um, and we discussed this, right? And it's really kind of counterintuitive the way you do a reverse fly. You actually want to promote the shoulders being rounded forward, uh, when you're flying, you're not thinking about flying back. You're thinking of flying out, and you're keeping that forward shoulder position while you do that in order to really target the readouts. The mm -hmm. moment you allow the back to retract and you fly back, which, by the way, is the is natural. So if yeah. you sat in a pec deck reverse and do a reverse fly, if you're doing the cable machine, you're doing that, it is natural for you to use momentum and allow your upper your, or your lower traps, your rhomboids, yeah. to all kick in and squeeze. They're bigger, stronger, more dominant muscles, so they're going to want to take over the movement unless you know how to keep them out of the movement, which most people just don't understand the biomechanics of that. So... First, I think, is understanding that. So if you haven't watched that video, watch that video. Uh, that's important. It's important to know how to do the movement properly. Then after that, it's just purely incorporating it into your routine. And you're right, Sal. It's probably one of the most neglected. And I think it, it's, it looks like it's the most neglected because even the people that are doing it aren't doing it properly. And so you have a lot of people with underdeveloped rear delts. Yeah, if you want really round shoulders, uh, it's really about the rear delts more than anything. I mean, when you look at someone from the side, what gives the shoulder a round look is the rear delt. Even when you look at them from the front, everybody thinks it's the side head of the deltoid, and that does play a role. But if you have no you know, rear delt muscles or if you have rear delt muscles that are underdeveloped, even with well-developed side delt muscles, you'll still get a forward sloping shoulder look. It's that rear delt that gives that really round, uh, bubbly look to the shoulders. And uh, like we talked about early in the episode, it, it's what ca it's what creates that, that, that illusion of definition throughout the whole arm. So definitely do not neglect this part uh, of your body. Now, we went through a lot of exercises and movements. There's 10 of them here. You may be wondering, how do I incorporate these uh, into my routine. I'll tell you what, easy way to do this. Take three or four of the movements that we talked about today, put them in your routine consistently for five to six weeks. Don't just throw them in once, try them out, and then go back to your normal routine. You're not going to see the benefits of them if you yeah, do it that get way. Get good at them. Yeah. Get good at them. Th pick three or four. That's all. Three or four of all the ones we talked about, and then put them in your shoulder routine uh, you know, regularly. Every time you work out shoulders, get good at them for the next five, six, seven, eight weeks, and then watch what happens to the development of your shoulders. And if you want more information and more detailed written information, you can go to mindpumpfree.com. There is a shoulder guide on there. There's a guide on how to develop uh, nice-looking shoulders or massive shoulders. I don't remember the wordage uh, that was on there. You can download it. It's totally free, and it goes through other aspects of shoulder development in detail, in writing, and again, it costs uh, absolutely nothing. Look, Mind Pump is recorded on video as well as audio. Come find us on YouTube, Mind Pump Podcast. You can also find all of us on Instagram, including the producer, Doug. You can find Doug at Mind Pump Doug, Justin at Mind Pump Justin, me at Mind Pump Sal, and Adam at Mind Pump Adam. 
Yeah, dude. That's why this is like my fourth cup. You know, like uh, wow, <laughs> whoa, so, whoa, dude. Wow. I mean, not nitro, but it's definitely number three for nitro. So. <laughs> yeah, wow. That's, what that's, was the f- that's uh, what was it's the heavy? Fir- it's a heavy hand this morning. What yeah. was the first one? Just at home? The yeah, brew? It's at home. The brew. Yeah, the drive the, over here doesn't right? count. Dude, so do you? Okay, do you have a cup 